<laughs> You're our first repeat guest. It's exciting. Really? Yeah. yeah. Oh my god, I feel so honored. Yeah, Dude, we That's are fired sick. up. Yeah, <laughs> recurring pilgrim. I was actually just thinking, yeah, I made the pilgrimage back. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I yeah. want to make this like a South by Southwest trend. You know what I mean? We just talk like what happened at South by. Yeah, yeah. South by. Give us a yearly update. Right. This is like one of those conferences that I feel like you cannot miss. Um, especially if you're in certain sectors like creator economy or media, mm -hmm. um, or consumer, like there's just this energy at South by, which is so special. On this week's dose, we welcome back Max Albert, the CEO and founder of AppStop, one of the leading mobile game studios focused on advert games. Yeah, great to have Max back. We start off with an update on this year's South by Southwest and how that's been going for Max. Uh, so lucky to have him in between all the events he's hosted, sponsored, and all the networking meetups he's been doing, which we'll hear a little bit about in this episode. Yeah, Max was certainly busy this week, so we're extra grateful he was able to stop by. Uh, on top of that, you'll also hear about Max's thoughts on AI this year at South by Southwest and more broadly as well as the latest with AppStop and the state of Adver Games as he sees it today. Lots of laughs and cool stories shared <laughs> in our first ever recurring guest interview. So uh, truly an honor to have Max as the first recurring Pilgrim interview guest. An honor and a pleasure and a first milestone for us. We hope this is the start of a yearly tradition. Mm -hmm. Seems like it might be. Yeah. But without further ado, here's our conversation with Max. This is Venture Pill, your weekly dose of startups and venture capital. We break down recent startups in the news and interview founders and investors to help you stay informed in the evolving world of venture. On this week's dose, we welcome back Max Albert, our first recurring guest, recurring pilgrim. Recurring pilgrim. For those who may not remember, we interviewed him back on episode 61, so about 50 episodes ago. And as a reminder, Max is the founder and CEO of AppStop, one of the leading mobile game studios focused on advert games. Max, it is just great to have you back here, man. How's it going? Always a pleasure, guys. It's going yeah. amazing. The pleasure is truly ours. Of course, you're in town for South by Southwest. So let's start there. Give us a little recap. How was your overall South by experience? Any notable events and or trends that you may have picked up on? Yeah, absolutely. That's a thick question. <laughs> <laughs> South by this year, 10 out of 10. Um, like the activations were super cool. I think kind of highlights um, Pool Suite X Yahoo. Did you guys get to attend that one or no? Mm -mm. The mm -mm. line was like to the moon. So <laughs> like, I don't like blame people for missing it. But are you guys familiar with Pool Suite at least? Educate no. us, please. Pool Suite is this really cool company. I need to get better educated on it myself, honestly. But they came out of the crypto craze in 2021. First, they started selling NFTs. But as crypto has kind of gone into winter, they've transitioned to more retail. And now they sell sunscreen. <laughs> it's called, what? It's called vacation. Yeah. What a pivot. What a pivot. <laughs> but they've always put like branding and brand marketing first. They have curated this like amazing like Y2K vacation centric brand. Mm. Like, and they're just known for throwing these incredible pool parties. <laughs> and so Yahoo hired them to throw a pool party here at South by. And it was absolutely like without a doubt one of the highlight events of South by. People wow. were talking about it like crazy. <laughs> There were all these atmosphere models that were like typing on like old 2000s era computers, mm. like as you walked in, <laughs> um, they put me in like an Austin Powers wig and a scarf to make <laughs> me more Y2K like <laughs> at the party. Um, but I think the larger like takeaway from a party like that being hosted at South by and how it had so much attraction was ju just this um, emphasis on community event throwing, social clubs. People like to belong to communities like Pool Suite. They're looking for that connection. Um, yeah, and I think it's a really interesting trend to watch and follow. Yeah, and then you had 
your hand in a lot of events, whether it's sponsorship or hosting. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about those. What, what were some highlights from that? I sponsored the Tech Carnival event at In Cahoots, which was really fun. Mm -hmm. uh, this one was an event that a little over 2,000 people attended this wow. year. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. We had 400 accredited investors, which was really special. Mm. And then um, a lot of startups that were participated. And rather than doing like the boring booths that everybody kind of hates, mm -hmm. we made all the startups man different carnival games. So awesome. like, yeah, Dunk Tank, uh, <laughs> Bottle Toss, like their mm. Benjamin uh, as a startup, they brought like a money catching machine mm. where you tried to catch like flying $1 bills and everything you caught, you got to keep. Yeah. yeah. Um, like invert your shirt like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a booth or a carnival um, game? I was actually kind of more of a wanderer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm not like raising at this current moment. So I yeah. didn't really feel the need, but honestly, um, you know, the best way to like interact with VCs, in my opinion, is to like get on their radar, like make that connection before you start raising. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they get familiar with you and then go into it afterwards. So, yeah, I guess the same of any relationship <laughs> in networking, right? Like mm -hmm. not really asking for something when you meet someone that's a common piece of advice or even bringing something to the table, but in a more casual setting like that, it's super fun. I know we met some random people from different from different industries, yeah. made some connections that we would have never thought. So you just never know of course. where you're going to get out of an event like that. And if I ever really need to raise capital, I'm just taking Brandon here to the money catching machine. And we're <laughs> yeah, going there. Got you. <laughs> <laughs> Bring the biggest shirt I have. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But so what do you like, what do you get out of planning events? Like we wanted to ask you a little bit about that. Like if other people are thinking about throwing something together, like how do you even, how do you even do that for 2000 people, much less? I honestly, just, yeah, I honestly just love it. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, I think that it's just, it's just fun. Like I always like hosting. Um, I like the fact that I, I'm just really passionate about connecting with passionate people. And like when I get to meet startups all in one place, like having a blast and being productive. Yeah. It just makes my heart full. <laughs> yeah. so but that has to be a lot of logistics like i guess it's just finding the right venue and sponsors and getting everything paid for but like two thousand people it just seems like how could someone even do that without you know prior experience yeah you know what's really funny about that is like two things number one is a like the co-hosts you know mm -hmm. the main organizer of that event was brett Holmer. he's the founder of bullet pitch which you guys are probably familiar of mm -hmm. um He's incredible. He's a force of nature. And he really got the details in order. Um, so ha I think having a right co-host is really important. But then the other thing is it gets easier and easier every year you do it. Like now I have a network of like vodka companies and tequila companies and stuff <laughs> that will just like, I have to just send them a text and be like, hey, do you want to give us a few cases? And they'll be like, sure. You know, so hmm. um, yeah, just like everything in life gets easier and easier mm -hmm. yeah. the more you do it. Those are good contacts to have. Actually. Yeah, they <laughs> really are. <laughs> um, that's awesome. Want to get into and update how things are going with AppStop. But before we tie the knot on South by, I think I know the answer just from, I think it was an Instagram story, maybe a Twitter post. But what's been the best meal you've had here while in Austin? Oh, my gosh. I'm trying to remember what. Oh, oh, oh. I mean, Uchi... I ate mm -hmm. at Uchi and also Terry Black's. Mm. So those two are kind of tied for me. You did it right, my friend. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I actually took like all the app stop clients that were in town for South by out to Terry Black's all at once. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And then like half of them were like, Max, like, do you want a bigger contract? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because, like, <laughs> this food was insane. <laughs> pay, pay you in beef ribs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, okay, um, but I was gonna say before we move on from other trends, I really want to talk about AI at South by Southwest. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, because um, I find it really fascinating. I feel like this conference was supposed to be like AI. I think it was supposed to be like the South by Southwest for AI. Mm -hmm. I felt honestly like there was some a lot of AI hopefuls, but I actually noticed a big disconnect between the AI founders and the hobbyists and kind of the VCs to the actual incumbents that are gonna use some of these AI products. And what I mean by that is, I was at Brand Innovators, 
and I was listening to uh, Chobani's uh, Chobani brand manager speak on a panel with a founder. Um, I won't name the founder out of privacy reasons, but he started a company that creates AI generated TV commercials. Mm. And for the first half of the panel, he was raving about his product. He basically didn't let the Chobani person get in a word edgewise because <laughs> he was just like raving about how cool um, his product is and how much traction he's gotten. He's actually produced some cool TV commercials and stuff. But then when the moderator turned it over to the Chobani person, he said something really interesting. He said, as a brand manager, our goal is to foster a brand image that is incredibly genuine. And artificial intelligence, it has artificial in the name. Mm -hmm. We don't know if it's the right fit for a lot of brands. And no. basically, this this guy who was super bombastic and excited, like kind of like slumped back in his chair, a little bit more embarrassed, a little bit more shy and coy. And it was this like really important moment I felt, not just oh. at Brand Innovators, but all of South by, where we realized like, yeah, AI has a lot of really interesting practical applications. But I think for the past two years, we've been over exaggerating them, over exaggerating them, over exaggerating them. And now I think a lot of these people who are actually using these products are getting tired of it. Huh. Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, I'm a little bit of a counter voice in that way. Yeah. But I noticed that from a lot of the brand managers I talked to, a lot of people in ad tech saying, I don't know. I think it's, we're, we're looking a little bit more away from AI. Mm -hmm. And so you think the why there is just because you want that genuine image and connection with your audience? I think it's just not quite there. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like, let's just be honest. Like these companies, these major fortune 500 companies, they don't actually put out that much content into the world. And when they do, they want it to be a 10 out of 10 High quality. Yeah. And AI, like it might give you like, it's gotten really good, but it might give you an eight out of 10, you know? And it also has this element of like lack of control that I think the brands like really like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, in five years, you know, maybe like you could just type into chat GPT, like, hey, give me a Chobani commercial and then like <laughs> freaking run it on like every major television channel in the Super Bowl. Yeah. But um, let's just be honest with ourselves. Like it's not there like right now, you know? Yeah. And I think there are applications that, that we've certainly covered that it is getting there, right? Or right. it is there. Maybe not within the, the world of advertising. What about within the world of gaming, like in, in game design and creation? I was curious about that, shifting a little bit more towards your world on if that I, side of things. If I had a dollar for every time I had this conversation at South by Southwest, <laughs> I'm going to have like one. This is going to be the final one, I hope. Um, You'd be like Brandon. Yeah, and the I was thinking. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so about 2% of our like mobile games assets is generated with AI. Hmm. Um, and I met so many like AI people at South by Southwest and they're the hopefuls and they're the people saying, you got to make a hundred percent of your art assets generated with AI. I kept telling them, listen, we feel we've tried. We feel that it reduces the quality of the product to go any further than what we've done currently. Hmm. Um, and they can't accept that answer. Mm -hmm. They're like, <laughs> <laughs> they're like, you're wrong. You got to check out this product, that product, this product. Um, and listen, I'm excited about AI. I really am. And I think, you know, five years, who knows, maybe a hundred percent of my assets really is generated with AI. But right now I really don't think that it's quite to the level of where these hopefuls are saying that it is. And there's an element of fatigue. You know what I mean? Every single time they give you a new AI product, vetting it, seeing yeah. how it could fit into your business, you know, yeah, eventually yeah. you just get bored and you're like, all right, I'm ready mm -hmm. for the next hype cycle. Like what's going <laughs> yeah. on next? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. Sam and I were actually talking yesterday about a different company called Rapid SOS, works in the emergency first response, $150 million Series C, huge round. Mm -hmm. Um and they like really focused in on the communications around that fundraise being about like basically pairing artificial intelligence with human intelligence and some other interviews we've had I'm thinking about Larson Jensen talks about like AI not entirely replacing humans because humans still want that genuine connection of course mm -hmm. uh, but basically like a partnership between the two where AI is like giving you the best you can and maybe uh, relieving some administrative tasks but like still ultimately the human is like the one that's making the wheels go and like pushing things through the final finish line. 
Absolutely. Yeah, I totally see it. And I see the vision. I really do. I'm excited for when I can use 100% of my assets Mm -hmm. uh, with AI because it's the most expensive part of the game design process. You know, we... Some, some of our mobile games have hundreds of thousands of assets that have to be hand-drawn. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's crazy. So it's expensive Old yeah. and time-consuming. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, so AI could really help. But, yeah, is it there right now? I don't know. Can I tell you, by the way, what I think the next hype cycle is yeah. going to be? Please. Um, You're on the record. <laughs> <laughs> on the record. Betting man. <laughs> autonomous vehicles. Mm. I went to some panels at South by I have some friends in the AV space because I used to work at Ford Motor Company Mm -hmm. it's getting really good it's getting really really good and not just from like a driving like perspective but from like a pragmatic perspective like I'm hearing people talk about accessibility like how do we make it work for more people how do we make it work for more cities Mm. Um, I think like we could wake up one day pretty soon and be like oh crap a lot of people are driving (laughs) autonomous vehicles right now yeah. Wow. yeah, I mean, I don't know if you've, you know, been on the right street at the right time in Austin, but they are certainly starting yeah. to release They're circling around fleets yeah. of electric vehicles. I think Waymo is the big company behind mm-hmm. it, but there might be a couple other competitors. But yeah, it is like happening already. And I've actually uh, taken a ride in one to go downtown. And it was weird. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was cool, but it's yeah. just like, oh, I guess it's making a left turn right now. Like, <laughs> like, yeah. like it's, it's a little scary. Um, definitely a little bit of a hurdle, mental hurdle to kind of overcome with that. But it, it feels like it's, it's literally already wheels on the ground, so to speak, yeah. here in Austin. Totally. No, I'm, I'm right there. I'll say like when I worked at Ford Motor Company as a software engineer, I worked kind of adjacent to the AV team. I supplied them with a lot of uh, data products Mm -hmm. and I kind of have some like insider baseball information of how they thought of it. I remember always a huge challenge of theirs was how do we make the passenger feel safe giving up that control? (laughs) Yeah. Um, even back when I worked at Ford, um, you know, over two years ago at this point, it was safer. Like if we replaced every car in the U S with AVs, it would save lives, but we can't do that mostly because of what you're saying, Brandon, like can't give up control. Yeah. The driver. Well, I feel like another thing there, and I know you got places to be, so I don't want to keep riffing (laughs) riffing too hard. It's too easy to talk to you about this, but um, I feel like another part with the AI integration into driving, same deal with AI lawyers or legal advice. Um, Mm -hmm. If the AI is wrong, let's say they give you bad legal advice or they get into an accident, it like opens a whole can of worms in terms of liability, who's at fault, and I feel like that's been another thing that has maybe slowed the progress in the AV space. Absolutely. Yeah. Like who is liable? You know, is it the manufacturer? Is it the driver? Is it the pedestrian? Is it all the above? <laughs> it's, it's, it's really interesting because we build society around all these like norms. And then when a new tech product comes out, it feels like, okay, we got to throw all that out the window <laughs> yeah. and figure it all out again. Just leave it to the AI lawyers to yeah. litigate against each other. <laughs> <laughs> We're just pawns. <laughs> Pretty much. We laugh about it, but that could be that could be a reality. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. Slightly nervous laugh. Yeah. Um, okay. Moving forward here again. You're a busy guy. Stay busy at South by. Let's keep it moving. We'd love to hear an update on AppStop. How are things going? What are the latest updates? Yeah. Tell us so more. we raised around mm-hmm. in 2023. Thank you very Let's much. <laughs> very exciting. Congrats. Yeah, tell yeah. us about that. Uh, Tillotson Automotive. Mm-hmm. They're an international automotive company. Um, they make a lot of automotive products like engines, but something that they're most famous for making, which is kind of cool, is the best go-karts in the world. Huh. Wow. It's the go-karts that like, Max Verstappen and Lewis Hamilton trained on before they went to yeah. Formula oh. 3. Yeah. And they host these like racing series for like all the best racers around, you know, the earth and Spain and the U S and France yeah. and stuff. Um, but anyways, uh, we're talking about the in-game advertising market and it seems like their philosophy is really aligned with ours. They're really excited to create an advertising game for Tillotson. Hmm. And so that's kind of part of, um, the investment strategy there for them. And yeah, it's, yeah. it seems like an unlikely marriage. Yeah. A little bit unlikely, but how did um, that come about? You know, this is, again, like one of the relationships that I've had for a long time. And 
uh, the president of Tillotson is actually just a huge Mario Kart fan and a huge gamer. <laughs> and so like, yeah, kind of unlikely, but really honestly, like, um, working with them has been incredible. And I think we have all the resources there, mm -hmm. um, to make this partnership really work. I think another big reason, by the way, why this is super strategic is they have their own network. So they have sponsors, uh, like Maxis tires and go power sports, mm -hmm. um, and title. Um, and so they feel like they can funnel some of those automotive brands that sponsor them down into our racing advert games. Okay. So is it going to be more of a focus on racing advert games? That's the definitely our like main, yeah. uh, main, um, product that we're focused on for yeah. 2024. I think about app stop in three phases. It's number one, how can we make the most popular advert game in history? And mm -hmm. that's going to be this racing game. Yeah. Um, and it's going to be a platform for all the brands to get in. So rather than creating like a new advert game for Tillotson and Maxis tires and go power sports, and all this stuff, you get it to the top and then you just can cycle brands in and out based on how much they're mm. willing to spend with you. So that means custom levels in the game, um, custom call to actions to go buy the product, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's phase one. Yeah. Phase two is to do that copy paste across all the major categories of mobile. So we're talking about sports. We're talking about, uh, lifestyle. We're talking about match three, uh, word, um, mm -hmm. games. And then after phase two is complete, then we want to license the technology that we've built, uh, the ad tech technology to produce kind of these really exciting endemic in-game advertising opportunities push it out to a whole bunch of more game studios in our network. Amazing. And we're already kind of doing like some phase two and phase three E stuff. So like we're kind of getting ahead of it. So yeah. Yeah. Nice. Well, that's good. With that fundraise, any expansions to the team, new hires? Yeah. We're really excited. We brought on Nikki Gathright as our CMO. Yeah. And, uh, he's huge. Uh, he won fear factor. Mm. and uh <laughs> no way yeah well a while ago and then he leveraged that like reality tv fame um into a digital pre digital presence he leveraged that digital presence into founding an ad agency called elevate um elevate works with some of the biggest brands in the world mm -hmm. nike fashion nova um just to name a few and so he's been really important to the whole strategy of getting the content creators to star in the games and also getting the brands to sign on to the games. Nice. So yeah, he's got a massive following. So is he full time with you guys, or is it more of a part time role? Or I'd say a hybrid yeah. uh, position. But one of the things that we really like about it is his other job is kind of aligned with yeah. the thesis of what we're trying to do, yeah. right? Which is he's out there winning businesses at conferences like South by Southwest. He's interfacing with brands. He's interfacing with content creators. Mm -hmm. um, so nothing that he's doing outside of AppStop isn't benefiting AppStop. Yeah. yeah, that's good. A lot of synergy there. Right. I guess the one other thing we want to hear about, like new brand deals, I think you mentioned one of those tire companies. Tell us about that. Yeah, so like many of the automotive brands that sponsor Tillotson are really mm -hmm. excited to also sponsor us and kind of increase their ad spend with us. Mm -hmm. um, so that's exciting. And, um, we also have glow beverages, which is a CPG brand, um, energy drink company started by this relatively small influencer, Kylie Jenner. I don't know if you guys are <laughs> with her. Um, nah. yeah, no, nah. she, she started an energy drink company and they're, um, also going to be, uh, advertising in a racing game. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. So super, super cool. Well, we're going to have to send you guys the beta build in April and, uh, get your opinion on it. Yeah. I love that. Outside of that, any new popular advert games that have emerged in the past year, maybe outside of AppStop? Yeah, a couple. There, there are two, I think, noteworthy ones. Uh, Tommy Hilfinger created, created a game called Fashionverse. Um, he was here at South By, actually. He was mm. speaking on a panel mm. specifically about Fashionverse, which shows you like how excited he is about this product. Yeah. They leverage AI to kind of like dress a character um, and kind of the goal is eventually they're going to have other brands. The first one was Michael Kors come in and put some of their clothing on the characters. Um, I played it. I loved it. Really got in touch with my feminine side. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was really, really exciting to see. Um, so that's one. 
And then Coco Chanel created um, a game as well. That one, I think, I'd have to do more digging into the numbers, but not nearly as uh, exciting, in my opinion, as Fashionverse. Hmm. But still a major brand releasing a major ad for game, so noteworthy in, in that regard. Yeah. So if you had to like put a bow on the last year, like what what is the state of in-game advertising today? The it, the state of in-game advertising is really strong. I mean, yeah. this is this is a sector of gaming that has grown thirty percent year over year ever since twenty nineteen, and everyone that I've talked to, really smart people, suspect it'll continue to grow, you know, for the next 10, 15 years. The reason being is because when you look at Fortune 500 companies' ad spend, still today, only like 5% Hmm. is spent on gaming. Wow. Which is like way too low. That doesn't really match the the number of eyeballs and activity and exactly. energy. Gaming, the gaming is the world. largest entertainment industry on earth. It's bigger than movies and music combined. It transcends, you know, contrary to popular belief, like age and demographic breakdowns. You have a lot of women, even older women, playing games constantly. And so I think these brands are starting to feel the pressure a little bit um, and saying, hey, we need to figure out this gaming thing. We've been yeah. ignoring it for too long. <laughs> um, I was at Brand Innovators. Mm-hmm. It's like one of the most important secret side conferences of South by Southwest. This is where all of the major CMOs of many Fortune 500 companies gather in this one little small barbecue joint in Austin mm-hmm. called Lambert's. Lambert's, yeah. Wow. And they meet with a lot of the most exciting ad tech companies um, on the scene and basically figure out in that room how the world's experimental marketing dollars are going to be spent. Wow. Is, kid you not, like at one of these parties, $250 million in deal flow gets done. Wow. It's nuts. Um, it's a circus. And it's what uh, barbecue will do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You like guard down, you know, yeah. like have a good time yeah. and boom, we're, we're in business. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's 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 really exciting place to be if you're an ad tech like myself. Uh, I to use a Hamilton reference, I think it's really the room where it happens. Like mm. I always tell people in marketing <laughs> and ad tech, like find any excuse, like tell the bouncer anything. Like mm-hmm. you have to get in there. Um, yeah, so talking to brands at Brand Innovators, obviously this was kind of still the brand innovators of AI. I'd say a lot of them talked about AI. They talked about their challenges with AI a lot, which is again, why I'm telling you guys, I think there's a little bit of a disconnect between the founders and the people using the products. Mm -hmm. Um, but gaming was starting to creep into the conversation, which made me really excited because I've been attending South by now for this, my third year Mm -hmm. and literally like the past two years is been like pulling teeth trying to get them to talk about their in-game advertising strategy mm. they're like we hate it nothing works we don't want to touch it anymore um, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and so uh now like they're really starting to, to to have those conversations and it's really exciting for me yeah any new last time we spoke about gen alpha and our yeah. <laughs> proclivity to disliking them or at yeah. least mine yeah. um <laughs> Any new data or intel on like their preferences, what they're looking for in a game? Nothing's really has changed much in a year. I mean, all the same things that were true last year. They basically, they still really like Roblox, Minecraft, Fortnite. And I think when it comes to the marketing side of things, that's really where my specialty is. This UGC is really important and really impactful. Mm-hmm. So like, user generated content. Yes, mm-hmm. user generated content. So basically like if I'm Pringles, I can go in and I can create a game in uh, Fortnite and then push it up to the top 10 like UGC Fortnite maps of that week and yeah. get it in front of you know millions potentially of Gen Alpha yeah. Fortnite players. Quite literally like I have a friend um Krishna, he's the chief financial officer of a company called Event Games that quite literally did exactly what I just said mm-hmm. um, for Pringles. So brands are really, I mean, almost all the brands are playing in that space right yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess with, like, as you look ahead for App Stop, you got this funding in the door. Mm-hmm. You're seeing the, ga- the gaming industry being taken more seriously as a 
uh, means to advertise and more effectively advertise. How how are you at AppStop? Like, how are you making it easy for brands to see the light? And, and like, what? Why work with you as opposed to do it themselves or work with someone else? Like, how are you thinking about that? I think part of it is the fact that I'm the only one doing it on mobile. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My biggest competitor was a company called Gamify. It uh-huh. was a pretty nice Series A, ten million. You could go look them up. They created advert games on mobile for Wendy's, KFC, um, Nissan, Mm. Pita Pit, a a few interesting brands. But none of their advert games were good at all. I mean, they (laughs) they didn't even make the top 100 list. And we talked about this the last time we chatted. Um, That's pathetic. You know what I mean? Like, if you're a Wendy's, like, you're not competing for top 100. Like, you want to be number one. Mm. You know what I mean? So... um, I think their strategy, Gamify, was very flawed. I think they were also a little bit too early. Mm. And um, I think I'm meeting the moment. I think that we're just starting now to start to go into this wave of excitement with in-game advertising, especially on the mobile space. The other thing that I'll say about us is we've had a lot of changes in philosophy. You know, I felt that maybe building an, an advert game from scratch every time was the right strategy. But I think now, talking to brands more and more, they want a very low-risk solution. Mm -hmm. So if your racing game, for instance, is already popular, to integrate into that, Mm -hmm. and you can just say definitively, like, hey, we expect there to be 50,000 active users uh, because there was last week, they really respect that. Yeah. Yeah. It's like white labeling the game, Mm -hmm. almost. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So you can play it. I mean, literally we have a campaign very similar to Candy Crush and then every now and then a a branded campaign level will come up um, Mm -hmm. and you play it and then you continue playing the game. I see. And what's so awesome about it is it's so embedded into the campaign that many of our play testers, they literally can't even tell us that they just watched an ad. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) Which is actually a little bit scary. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. We were thinking maybe we should have a warning at the beginning of the game that says, hello, like this is an advert game, like pay attention consumers just to be kind to our players. Yeah. Um, But yeah, it's, it's really exciting how, how, how much they love playing this branded content, you know? That's incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like someone, someone plays your game and three days later have this uncontrollable urge to go check out a tire shop. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, we, we, we were talking about this. Um, like I, I met a lot of amazing ad tech founders and there's always this desire when you first start an ad tech company, which is like my ad tech is the end all be all. You know what I mean? <laughs> like after my product comes on the scene, like advertisers mm. don't need anything else, you know, <laughs> but once you mature a little bit, you realize that consumers are like, They buy products for so many reasons. They don't just buy it for one or two reasons. You know, they get recommendations from their friends. They see it on a billboard. They watch like their favorite movie and see their favorite actor like wearing a certain piece of clothing. And then the combination of all those things is what inspires a consumer to make a purchase, Mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, I've been laughing with a lot of (laughs) ad tech companies because I've created some content, maybe even on this podcast, where I was like, dude, this is like the freaking next yeah. thing. Like yeah. everybody's gonna play our game and buy Maxis tires. I think this is a really strong like product and part of a larger mm-hmm. strategy for these brands. Yeah. Mm. That's that's well said. And so I don't know if you're at liberty to say, but I guess I'll start with the question, is there an ideal dream client that you would have? And then while you think about that, Obviously, you've got this automotive space, right? You were doing one tap victory lap Mm -hmm. uh, last time we spoke, and we've talked about fashion. We've talked about um, Gamify, how they were working in the KFC space, like food. Is there a different industry? Like, again, assuming you have automotive on lock, is there a different industry that you might want to look into? Feminine retail. Hmm. Sephora, I think Sephora, Gucci, Prada. Um, even Old Navy, things things of that nature. And the reason why is because people are really ignoring women 34 through 56 that play games. Mm. Um, Candy Crush, for instance, mm-hmm. 82% women ages 34 through 56. Wow. Uh, 31% of those players have household incomes of $100,000 or more. I've seen a lot of research to suggest that these women are very fashionable and they care a lot about the clothes that they wear. Kind of counterintuitive to what we typically think of gamers who are kind of 
they have one hand in the Pringles and one yeah. hand in the, <laughs> <laughs> and the sour cream and onion chips. Um, but yeah, no, these, these women are, have disposable income, they're fashionable and they're playing mobile games. Mm-hmm. And so I actually legitimately believe that by virtue of these brands, not having a mobile presence to target the, this specific demographic, they're losing tens of millions, sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars in value per year. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not a small, like, opportunity. This is a huge opportunity mm-hmm. that these brands are missing. So hmm. that can be exciting. Yeah. And then you mentioned other industries like sports, which you've played around in. Is that more? Is that more of a competitive space? Like this, that feminine fashion seems like a niche or a large niche that is untapped. <laughs> but sports maybe a little bit more saturated. I'll tell you, like the reason it's just brand education. You know, mm-hmm. a lot of these people. Uh, who are in feminine retail in the marketing space, um, they don't realize that women play games. I, I'll tell you a funny story. I'm not going to name any of the people <laughs> or the brand, mm. but I was in a physical meeting pitching a feminine retail brand, hey, you should make a match three adver game. And the brand manager basically said to me, women don't play games. And she was playing Candy Crush during the meeting. <laughs> what? <laughs> no way. I wanted to be like, yeah, like, um, hello? You like, sure about that? She doesn't, <laughs> she doesn't realize that's a game. Like, it's so integrated into yeah. her yeah. day-to-day. There's, there's actually, like, a big disconnect between the amount of people in the U.S. that will self-describe themselves as gamers mm-hmm. and um, the amount of people that actually play games regularly. Yeah. Yeah, it's so interesting. Mm-hmm. Wow. That could be a huge, a huge opportunity. Yeah, it's, yeah, it is. I mean, it's what, what, what the funny thing is. It's inevitable. It's going to happen. You know, these brands are going to start to have to get into mobile gaming, um, and we just hope that we can help them do that. Awesome. Changing gears here, uh, <laughs> yeah. Sam and I were both living vicariously through you on social media, but <laughs> you recently returned from a trip to Japan. Mm-hmm. Number one on the bucket list for me. I'm sure it was incredible. <laughs> Not going to ask for all the details. I'm sure you've done that at length already. But two quick hitters. A, what was the best thing you ate? Common theme here. Question <laughs> we like to ask. Uh, and also, is there anything you learned in your time in Japan that, uh, that you applied to your business with AppStop or just a general concept that maybe changed the way you think about entrepreneurship? Ooh, <laughs> Ooh I love this question. This is so good. <laughs> Start with like the thing that I ate. There's so many good things. Mm. I'm sure. Um, there's these, these restaurants in, in uh, Japan. There's these restaurants called Izakayas, mm. which are... <sighs> all right, you, uh, <laughs> no, I'm just <laughs> getting, getting, getting hungry. Sound, sounds know what that good, is. whatever. It, yeah. <laughs> it's like these really tiny restaurants. They might only have like six or eight seats that are like in the homes of the chefs. Wow. So it's it, like literally there was one that I went to kind of in the north part of Japan called Hokkaido. Um, that was the region. And then the restaurant was called Hiro. And it was literally just a dad and his wife cooking for us. And we just like went into their kitchen and that was like the izakaya experience. Wow. wow. And it was absolutely the best salmon I've ever had in my whole life. Mm. Like <laughs> just cooked perfectly. So fresh, like, amazing flavor we had everything on the menu yeah like everything and oh man (laughs) yeah um it was nuts i mean the ramen the yakiniku like i miss it i really do i want (laughs) to go back to japan so bad yeah Yeah. it almost might be an easier question to ask like did you have anything bad there (laughs) exactly (laughs) i don't know i don't think so (laughs) um what one of the things that people talk about a lot when they visit Japan is how surprised they are of the quality of the convenience store food. I was going to say, like heard in, about that. It's 7-Eleven here in the States. It's like obviously terrible. Mm-hmm. Sorry, 7-Eleven. Yeah. It's the truth. <laughs> um, Japan has a lot of pride in like their food. And so they, everything has to be high quality. So even the convenience store food, it's like perfectly cooked salmon, perfectly cooked chicken, like everything. Like, yeah, it's just, so trying to find something bad is hard in yeah. Japan is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then in terms of philosophy for my business, um, I think 
I'll say this. I've, you know, been digital nomading for the past, like, three years now. Mm -hmm. And I've never had a problem keeping up with my clients. They're mostly American-based. And I've traveled through Europe, um, had no issues. Japan was rough, really rough. Mm -hmm. There was, like, a lot of nights where I had to stay up until 2 a.m. to take a meeting, and then I'd have to wake up at 5, like, a couple hours later to (laughs) take another meeting. (laughs) Brutal. Um, And... It made me realize, like, I only want to work with clients that I really, truly love. And I really, truly feel like I can help solve their problems. Mm -hmm. Because some of the times I was waking up for meetings and I was like, you know, to be honest, like, am I really passionate about working with these people? I think they could be better better served elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that was a realization for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Super interesting. Yeah. It's It's a good takeaway. Yeah. Um, speaking of travel, we're, we're coming to your stomping grounds in September when Texas plays Michigan, no way. uh, in early September. So we're, we got an Airbnb there with a bunch yeah. of our friends. So we'll have to meet up if you're around. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Oh no. I'll show you around. I have some great tailgates I can take you to. Yeah. 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 It's going to be, uh, um, little, little pockets of burnt orange in a sea of Blue, amazing blue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It'll be fun. Maybe. I feel like UT travels super well. We do. We'll travel well. Yeah. yeah. But we booked our Airbnb literally a year in advance. Yeah. It's so, super cool. Yeah. No, I was going to say, like, Big Ten football in general, so exciting. Yeah. Like, or just college football in general. Yeah. Yeah. And the big it's houses. Like, Oh man, I've been there for a game once before. It's going to be fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we'll have to we'll have to meet up there. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be a blast. Belated congrats on the national title as well. I know. Thank you very yeah. much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that was all me. You know, I, <laughs> I was calling the plays. I was calling the real shots. Yeah. My booster money supported the team. Mm-hmm. I was doing some nil stuff behind the scenes. <laughs> no, I mean we're super happy. Super, super happy. People always say like Michigan is a little bit arrogant. <laughs> uh, we don't. No. We, we're, we're not those people. Not. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the reasons that they point to that's very real is our fight song. Most fight songs are like, hey, like, let's win this game. Like, let's, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, yeah. like, rah, rah, like, let's fight, let's fight, let's fight. The Michigan football theme song, Hail to the Victors, is about how we already won the game. We've already won the conference. We've already won the national championship, and we're the best in the world. <laughs> and so, like, that's a pretty arrogant statement. And I just thought, like, for once in my life, our fight song is actually true. Like, it holds true. <laughs> yeah. Like, yep. we actually lived up to it. Heading, in, heading into our game, that will hold fully true. Yeah. And maybe until the end. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be a blast, though. But, yeah, you've been to Austin so many times. And we, we got to come up to Ann Arbor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. No, please let me know because the other thing I can do is I can show you around the Ann Arbor tech scene. Mm-hmm. There's some really exciting startups. Maybe I can say this really quick before the pod wraps. My business couldn't exist anywhere else but Ann Arbor. I fervently believe that. Hmm. We have some of the best programming talent in the world coming out of Ann Arbor, mm-hmm. U of M Ann Arbor. And then some of the best like art game design coming out of Michigan State. Oh, and really? And so congregate them in Ann Arbor. Most of the times they go to California or to Austin, Texas. Austin's a huge gaming city. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, to keep them in Ann Arbor, get them a little bit cheaper. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, the city of Ann Arbor also subsidizes my business oh, wow. just to help no me way. stay there. Yeah, That's cool. It's <laughs> pretty cool. Game. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When do you get the key to the city? Yeah, <laughs> That's a good question. Maybe I should run for mayor after my... <laughs> After I sell this, you know, yeah. <laughs> you've got our vote if we're there. Yeah. If we're there. Yeah. Well, Max, a, a, another pleasurable conversation today, and and hopefully it's an annual tradition for us. Mm-hmm. Maybe a little mid mid year check in in Ann Arbor then. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I love that. It'd <laughs> okay. be super cool. Dude, great. First recurring guest. Yeah. <laughs> it feels awesome. good. It feels great. good. I feel really great, guys. This has been excellent. Yeah. yeah. We'll do it again sometime soon. Mm-hmm. It, I guess what you could say is I need a double dose. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor's orders. <laughs> We're making the reverse pilgrimage up to up to Michigan. Yes, yes. <laughs> It'd be great. You could, uh, when you're there, I could pill up your cup. Mm. <laughs> Over some pilsners? Over some pilsners. Over some pilsners, <laughs> yeah. 
I feel like these have been so bad right now. <laughs> that's that's up to our standard though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's but, a high uh, high volume out high high output. Yeah. Some gold but, will uh, come out eventually. Let's, let's cut it there yeah. <laughs> before it gets any worse. Yeah. Again, thank you, Max, for taking the time. Truly a pleasure. Hope you had a great South by. And uh, until next time, my friend. Yeah, until next time. Thanks, man. Yes, sir. <laughs>